So hello everyone. Um, welcome to our research roundtable online series um, organized by the Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad. Um, today we have with us Dr. Elfrida Pursic, who will be discussing with Professor Usha Raman on the subject uh, rethinking media representation. Uh, Dr. Fusich is an internationally recognized media scholar and academic and is currently working as visiting associate professor at the Department of Communication, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she specializes in issues of globalization, mobilities, journalism, popular culture and cultural diversity and has investigated discourses of globalization in media ranging from travel programs and music reviews to business journalism and online news schemes. Um, she has co-edited the book on travel journalism, Exploring Production, Impact and Culture. It was published in 2014. And she was also selected to write an expert report on media and the representation of others for the UNESCO World Report, investigating in cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue. Um, professor Usha Raman is a professor in the Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad, where she teaches creative writing, science and health communication, and digital cultures. Uh, her research areas include feminist media studies, datafication, cyber cultures, children and media, among others. She is currently one of the vice presidents of the International Association for Media and Communication Research, IEMCR. Uh, so hello, Elfride ma'am and Usha ma'am. I welcome you to this session. Uh, we hope to have this discussion for about 40 minutes. Uh, Dr. Fusish would be speaking about her work for about 25 minutes followed by a few questions from Professor Usha Rahman for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, after that, we'll have a short live question answer session for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, participants, you may post your questions along with your name and affiliation in the chat box here in Zoom or in the comment box under the FB live event. Um, please note that the session is being recorded. And um, over to you, Elfride, ma'am. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so my thank, uh, uh, thank yous go really to you, Amrita, and uh, Kaita Kadia, I guess is how I pronounce it, is uh, for inviting me and for organizing um, this talk. It's really wonderful. And then, of course, also, um, big hello and uh, thank you to my, uh, what I was going to say, old friend, but let's say long-term friend, <laughs> Usha Rahman, <laughs> who, um, you know, for engaging in my work and inviting me here. So this is really wonderful. And um, some of you know maybe that I was a visiting professor um, at the University of Hyderabad at your department, uh, uh, at your college um, in 2005, actually, so it's, it's uh, a while ago, but I fondly remember it and had really a great time in Hyderabad. Uh, I was living um, just next door at the uni business school um, uh, in, uh, in, in the School of Business at, uh, um, you know, next door to the university. So it was wonderful for half a year. Um, I also want to, of course, take a second to mark um, the losses um, uh, that this department, your department and your college and so many of you have suffered because of COVID. Of course, this talk also had to be changed because of COVID. Um, my heart really goes out to all of you um, who had um, to go through uh, the, the illness itself or had problems or had uh, lost uh, loved ones. So. Um, also, I want to mark that sadly COVID has not been a way to bring humanity together. I wish it had, you know, it's, I think it's about time that we stick together and get this thing over with. So I hope to see you all soon in person and I don't have to do this um, over soon. All right. So what I want to do today is I would like to... Um, um, talk about a book project I'm having right now. And this is in some sense, the culmination of my work uh, that I have been doing uh, for a long time. Um, the book is called Just Like the Talk, Rethinking Media Representation. Um, and it tries to kind of uh, look into a new way of understanding media representation, but also find some solutions for the media, um, for the issues that we have with media and society. So rethinking media representation. Uh, um, so as I mentioned, this is also the book title um, so far. <laughs> and there's another famous book uh, called uh, Representation uh, by Stuart Hall. Uh, and this is actually where it all started for me. So this is what I read first 
1997, um, how I, when I got into the field of cultural studies. So um, I and I'm still am in the area of media and cultural studies. Um, and we've been doing this now for quite a while. So for 30, 40 years, um, scholars have really redefined in many ways how we think about communication. And um, my intervention right now is after 30 years, we should really maybe think a little bit differently and, and get a, a new body of theoretical knowledge into this kind of understanding because we know a lot about representation now already. So the question is how can we actually uh, improve representation? Um, so for those of you who are not as familiar with uh, cultural studies, um, cultural studies scholars see representation as a um, circuit, uh, see, sorry, uh, communication as a circuit and culture as a circuit, and uh, as, as opposed to linear, of course, and so representation is right here on top, uh, one of the areas that are uh, considered central to understanding um, how media actually work. And uh, the advantage of representation, of the idea of representation is that it really helps us to understand the complexity of how media actually reflect or create the world. Um, and that's, I think, really central to understand. So as opposed to saying the media portrays, you know, specific um, people or specific groups. Um, but if you say you rep, they represent them, uh, represent these groups, we basically acknowledge that the media not only uh, reflect, but also constitute uh, in a certain, uh, or create certain ideas about the world. Um, so that's really uh, important to understand. So people who look into representation, look into the media content. So how is the content representing um, specific groups in society? Um, so this is kind of the first uh, basic understanding. And this was the invention of cultural studies. That was the contribution, a very central contribution of cultural studies to understand uh, or to explain to us what is representation. Um, okay, okay. So uh, what are, what's important about media representations is um, Media representation, and this is basically using Stuart Hall's language also. They're central signifying practices for producing shared meaning. So what's really important is also is to understand when we think about representation that we're not uh, talking about how are, um, how is something rep, um, you know, portrayed in the media and how is this really kind of influencing me or how do I perceive it personally uh, or individually? It's really about the social production of media. How do we make all of us sense of the world um, when engaging with the media? That's a kind of an important um, first uh, uh, other idea about representation. Um, then Sud Hall also said that representations are constitutive of culture, meaning, and knowledge. That means it's beyond just saying that they're giving us a sense of, um, you know, of what's going on in the world. They really ultimately create a world for us. Um, and then why should we bother? Why should we actually examine, uh, examine these kinds of representation? Well, there is a what Hall calls a chain of signification. Uh, whatever we see, whatever we um, experience right now in the media is historically connected. So the way, for example, in the United States, of course, it's always a, a big issue how it's race represented. So the way um, African-Americans, let's say, are, re are represented right now is connected to previous representations. Um, so even if they kind of challenge them or change them, there is a kind of a historic um, connection and the historic connection is oftentimes very problematic. Um, so they are tied uh, to ideology. That means um, ultimately the media, even if you know, there's so much creativity and innovation in media, and there's, you know, it's, of course, it's also an art form, and there's also you know, uh, media also in a competitive situation, so they try to expand our ideas about the world. Uh, but there is, they are kind of uh, caught in um, a, a specific ideology. Um, and that's an ideology. It doesn't mean like, oh, they are like a left leaning or right leaning. It's not the political ideology. It's beyond that really, really the worldview of how we understand um, the world. Um, and oftentimes because media have to attract a, a, the largest possible audience, they stay tied to the mainstream. Um, and, you know, this kind of imagined idea of, uh, of, 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 who we are, um, and uh, and and because of that, they're tied also to um, common sense. The idea: this is just how the world are, is. We show you how, what the world is. We show you what 
you know, reality is in this point. So common sense. This is what is normal in many ways. And then finally, um, this is also something to keep in mind that representations can never really be natural or true depictions. And that's not what we judge because obviously it is oftentimes fictional. Uh, it's oftentimes made up. That's you know, the media in, in the business of doing that. If you talk about entertainment, of course, um, but they are, uh, but even in the news, if you think about news, there is of course specific factors, specific factors of production and specific factors of uh, uh, professional routines that basically create um, uh, representations that are constructed images. You know, they can never, obviously, never represent the whole world to us, every aspect, every facet of it. All right. So this is Stuart Hall's idea, and of course, uh, people who followed him. Um, about representation very central. So this kind of work generated a huge stream of research um, that um, ultimately uh, looked into various forms of representation. So representation of race, class, gender, um, of nation, national identities. So it's uh, kind of a extremely large body of research. And over the years, we established certain principles and certain ideas of what's actually going on when media represent uh, specific groups. So. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, before I get, so get into the specifics of um, how we actually, how the media go about representations, um, what helps me a lot or help me something that I read very, very early on in my career as a, an academic, uh, John Fisk's work, uh, you might have heard, uh, John Fisk is a you know, guru of cultural studies, he recently passed away. Um, he is, he said something in 87 already that, um, and he talks about television, but he could actually say, you know, all media, television is perceived as realistic, not because it literally produces re reality, but because it reproduces the dominant sense of reality. Um, so that's, I think, really important when you uh, talk about uh, representations, because representations, representation itself is about creating realities or creating a reality. And oftentimes we kind of struggle or students struggle with this kind of sense of, um, you know, how do media compare to reality? So, you know, if you like, you know, right now we've all seen the disastrous coverage of the news in Afghanistan, for example, and, you know, what's going on right now in Kabul. And obviously what we see there is not every single moment, every single aspect of this um, takeover uh, by the Taliban, but we see a specific version of it right now. And the version, you know, looks different in different media across the world, uh, but it, it, it creates the sense for us what is happening there, you know, that, but the kind of agreed upon sense of this is what's going on right now in Afghanistan. Um, and it would take us a long time to figure out actually what really happened, right? But right now we get a version, a package um, that fits into the ideology, the national identities of the various countries that are showing this coverage. Okay. So what triggered my kind of um, idea for this book, it was basically uh, this general sense that uh, that you hear a lot right now within cultural media studies that we somehow seem to be um, at a point where things are not very interesting anymore. We've, we've, we've done a lot, we know a lot, but what's next kind of, and this is just an example. Ted uh, Stryfus is an American cultural studies scholar and he took over the journal called Cultural Studies and he wrote in this, um, this was 2019 recently, that after 50 years of existence, cultural studies seems to have lost its edge, right? There's something going on. I know it's being overtaken by new, uh, more, uh, other areas of inquiry. Um, so he says he's basically, uh, he kind of calls on us to, um, to, to, to revisit the, the, the central concepts, the, 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 the initial important concepts and, and rethink them and rework them. And I guess that's what I pick up here in my book. So I don't think cultural studies time may have passed. So. <laughs> okay, so this is the important uh, central um, table or graph in my first, in my second chapter in the book, where I basically uh, summarize a lot of research that I um, have um, 
you know, reviewed over the years and now, of course, also specifically for the book to kind of understand a bit more systematically what's actually going on, what can happen to a group, to various groups in when it comes to um, representation. What I think my contribution here is basically that I am um, really trying to um, go across various research on representation because oftentimes the, the research is done very separately. So we have specialists on representation of race, we have specialists on representation of gender, we have specialists on representation of class. And uh, so, you know, I feel like there's a lot of similarity. So we should really kind of work on finding kind of a structure that goes across the board. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is kind of... Um, a typical kind of idea that's behind this research. So the first step, obviously, the first step would be a group in 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 a in a society is absolutely ignored. So absence would be the first step. I left, leave that out. I kind of thought when we have kind of a, a sense of um, um, of representation. Um, so the first step then is symbolic annihilation, and that idea comes. It also has been around for a long time. It's the sense of that you might see characters of this group, but they're just, you know, they're not important. They're just on the sidelines. They're just kind of fading in the background. They're just, you know, part of the stage set in some sense, but they're not really part of the media conversation in many ways. And that's of course uh, detrimental and terrible. And that's. Um, ultimately also something that oftentimes triggered um, the kind of research we have been doing. So in the United States, actually to this day, you could, for example, argue that Native Americans are very, um, so indigenous people are very rarely um, made part of the conversation. So they are not, you know, to this day, absolutely uh, annihilated. Um, the next part then is the next kind of idea of dealing with people who are considered others, different, right, from this mainstream, from this what I always call imagined mainstream that we have, um, would be stereotyping. Uh, and a lot of work has shown us, especially historically also, how stereotypes have come about. So if you look into old Hollywood movies, you know, you really see um, the problems of uh, stereotyping when it comes to African Americans, for example, you know, when African American women, for example, were always just uh, nannies or, you know, servants or something, just very extreme stereotyping. Um, and that has been going on for a long time, for the longest time in the United States, of course, in, or in the Western world, um, white middle to upper class was the kind of dominant, uh, by the dominant groups um, that everybody else was, um, if they came up, if they were kind of um, in, in integrated, they were stereotyped. Uh, and that not just entertainment, also the news if, uh, in the United States, for example, is also very uh, well established. Um, groups, minority groups are heavily um, over, um, yeah, covered when it comes to crime. Right? It does not reflect at all actually the crime rates um, in, in reality. So, um, so problematic, uh, there's problematic stereotyping into this day also, but you know, especially historically, a lot of stereotyping um, in the news and in entertainment. So, and this is kind of a clear, I don't want to spend too much time to it. What's important now for me is much more, how do we actually overcome these stereotypes? How can we really work uh, to find ways of uh, dealing with problematic uh, representations? So the first idea, are we okay? Okay. The first thing that we had was counter stereotyping. Um, I I someone's microphone came on. Yes. It's open. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Um, so counter stereotyping is um, basically the idea of a, um, yeah, the classic example. And sorry, I have a lot of American examples here. So please film in, in on other examples also. Uh, but a classic example of uh, counter stereotyping is um, the global show, the Cosby show. You know, the one the show that had an African-American family for the first time in a sitcom, very positive portrayal. But all they did is basically they countered all the stereotypes that we had before. So the family was very successful. They were settled. They had, um, you know, it was um, race was not touched in this, in some sense, racial issues was not touched. So they became really exemplars in many ways for um, you know, for African-Americans. And again, the show was 
super ex extremely successful. So you could say, well, this is perfect, right? Now we overturned what's going on. Well, scholars have found that doing this, also picking model minorities or exemplars really gets this uh, sense of, um, you know, it's very, um, uh, race, it doesn't matter anymore, but right? it's not a problem. And that's, you know, it, it counters, it makes it even harder for people um, to kind of, um, to overcome the stereotypes because the, the counter stereotypes remain tied to the stereotype. Uh, is this visible? <laughs> yes, that's visible. <laughs> okay, come on. That's how we do it for now, okay? Uh, you have to low tech, yeah. it's better. So we are counter stereotyping, right? So um, just to kind of keep that in mind, what I'm talking about. So yeah, we talked about Cosby and that it's, um, Cosby was of course trying to counter stereotype, but it really keeps intact the, uh, the ultimate race structure because it uh, you know, just tries to counter everything and uh, by using one exemplar and uh, doesn't really, in some sense, ultimately, uh, famously, there was a study done that showed that people were actually holding it against African-Americans even more if they didn't succeed in life you know, in the United States, because they could say now, well, look at Cosby's, look at the Cosby's, they did it, right? They, the Huxtables, I guess they were called in, in the show. And okay, and then we talk about the resistance. Okay. Yeah, I can do it again. Perfect. Uh, good. Now you see it in fancy colors again, right? Perfect. Yes. <laughs> I worked hard on this. So this is nice. <laughs> All right, let me check the time also that we're not running over. Okay, perfect. Um, so I do this a little faster. Now resistance is, as I said, media activism is very successful. Um, so, uh, you know, there are quite a few of Hollywood movies now, so Disney movies, for example, who have actually groups, uh, consultants that are talking about representation with people and making sure things are a little better. A hyper stereotyping is in some sense something that a lot of comedians use. Comedians oftentimes um, ex ex uh, use stereotyping to um, and exaggerate them so much that you ultimately feel like it's uh, it's absurd, right? What's going on here and challenge this really successfully. So you might have also have um, these kinds of stand up comedians in India who do that very successfully. Um, and then transcoding is an idea that Stuart Hall had actually talked about. It's he calls it something really nice. So you implode something from within in some uh, sense. He says, you know, since you cannot get rid of the stereotypes and the historic connections, you really have to like from within change them, like um, offer a new way of looking at it. Um, and it's a classic example is that of an athlete, an uh, African, uh, a black athlete in Britain who has the British flag around his shoulders uh, during the Olympics and kind of recreating a new idea of what the British nation actually, what, what the UK what the as a nation actually means. So that's kind of transcoding. And I give you, can give you other examples of that if that's not clear. And so the last phase, so this is the one where I'm interested in because all of these phases, the resistant phases, um, this is where we are right now. A lot of um, criticism um, of representation um, ends here to say, okay, we should maybe try something. But oftentimes media critics say, well, even this resistance is still leading back to old stereotypes. So we, you know, we need to escape that. So the criticism is very strong and very good also, but I don't think we have a very good idea where do we actually want to go to? What do we want? You know, what kind of representations do we want? And that's what I call kind of the ideal phase. Some people touch on it. Um, some uh, um, scholars saying that maybe we need more multicultural coverage. It comes up a lot, you know, more tolerant, more multicultural coverage. Uh, maybe you know, ideas of respect, you know, having people um, respecting various audiences, if that's kind of a, a basic principle of media work that would maybe change things. And, and there's, um, you know, uh, talk also about what, what you could call post-representation. So in the United States, people talk about are we in a post-race phase where, you know, we are not, we are now beyond these kind of categories. Um, they are maybe anyways invented these categories and should we move on from there? But I think the problem for me is that we have a lot of these ideas out there, but there's nothing concrete. We really don't see it. Um, and so, and this is maybe then for today, my last point, what I want to say is, um, uh, what I want to challenge is this, maybe the whole setup is a little bit wrong. Maybe the way we think about representation, where we want to go to is a little bit wrong. Let me highlight three points um, that I find uh, problematic. The first one is this, what I would call an unquestioned progressivist setup of this trajectory. So cultural 
or studies is uh, political critique, is a progressive critique, of course, on how we see the world, how we see society. So scholars who are in this area tend to, of course, always look towards a, uh, a progressive change in, and um, somehow our, uh, and hopefully in the future, something will be better. And that's great. I mean, I am also a progressive, uh, a progressive um, um, critic. But um, we have to keep in mind that if we kind of if we talk in progression, we also have to see what's actually what, what where do we want to go to, and I think that's not really played out a whole lot. Well, I have a lot of research for the early phases. I have hardly anything about the last phase. The next point is that, um, that the point I started to make already that this last phase. Um, it's very ambiguous. There's no sense of what we actually want to do here. What would be the perfect media world? What should we really, how should we kind of position that? Um, is it actually possible? Uh, no, is it really possible? Is, is it because often it becomes very culturalist in a sense that the media seems to be the the solution. So if we are, if only the representations change, then society will also change. Well, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe society has to change first and then the media change. So that's kind of oftentimes an assumed um, uh, prioritization of, of the cultural aspects as opposed to maybe the materialistic um, aspects of society. And then finally, as my last point for now, um, uh, that we have um, the solutions in, in this work is are oftentimes in, uh, in, in, in the text, in the, in the content, um, and that leaves out, um, and again, repeats now a little bit what I said before, leaves out the sense of that media are created in a specific environment, and this environment also needs to change or needs to show um, um, you know, movement in some sense to be able to actually change representation. But I think, and this is uh, my very last point now before I ask Usha to kind of step in here, um, my idea for this book is to really kind of draw on newer um, research philosophy, political philosophy, the idea of um, 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 resistance in general is really important to understand. The idea of uh, recognition is also uh, important. Uh, political scientists have worked a lot on recognition as a part of um, national uh, of political identity. Um, so I think it's really important for us to reach out to different areas to understand, uh, to maybe uh, re-energize um, the idea of representation. Okay. Thank you. Um, Amrita, should I jump in or uh, should I just jump in with my comments and questions? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Elfrida. I think, you know, the first part of your talk was a nice primer for those who are not familiar with Stuart Hall's ideas. And, and, and I think the schema that you have for a sort of history of representation um, is really, again, really useful uh, to think with. Um, and I think most of us, a lot of us tend to be stuck in the second and third phases, right, of stereotyping, still studying stereotypes, still studying counter stereotypes. And you realize that that's really not taking us anywhere. Um, so I just wanted to open up um, uh, the questions by asking, um, you know, one of the things that you point to in your chapter is that you need a clearer theorizing. And you also mentioned that at the end. Uh, a clearer theorizing between representation and social change. Um, and you make the point in the chapter that there's an assumption that social life worlds and representations are um, disconnected. Um, but um, I'm wondering, you know, what do we do with digital media in this space? Because a lot of our conversation around representation, I think somehow tacitly assumes um, uh, the old media landscape mm -hmm. um, and how where and now when you have fractured audiences when you have production happening you know in multiple contexts and the circulation also you know taking many different directions then how do we think about this connection between social world and uh, media representation um, so do, do you want to talk a little bit about that Sure, yeah, I would think this is a really um, very important point. I think that's what also triggered in some sense the move away from cultural studies. I mean, you could argue that cultural media studies uh, stuck too long to traditional media and because they were so worried about the mainstream, right? This, uh, this kind of imagined group and that, uh, that could actually reinforce very problematic um, 
you know, ideas about the world. And so because of that, I think they've they lost track of digital uh, communication. I think you're absolutely right. And so the more exciting parts that, you know, Thryfus also talks about is oftentimes research that connects to digitalization. At the same time, I think what happened is over the last 20 years, also um, digitalization or the idea of dig or the, the public sphere surrounding digitalization has changed so much, you know, as, as it constantly changed. So it was difficult to kind of capture it or to understand what's going on. Uh, but I think we are at a point where, you know, even if you have every year another, you know, TikTok or something else we have to watch now, we have uh, starting to see a little bit better what actually is um, the public now that we have for digital worlds. Um, and I think I would argue, interestingly enough, uh, while uh, what you said is also correct, you know, that we have much more niche audiences and we have smaller groups and you find your own, whatever you, you know, you, you like, you find in your own uh, group, you have your echo chambers, you have all of that. Um, but it's um, uh, it ultimately, there's still, uh, I think, a sense of public there. You know, there's still a kind of, when something goes viral, there is a sense of it taps into, uh, you know, many, in, uh, uh, it connects so many people. So it means there must be something going on. It must tap to ideology in interesting ways that we should really investigate. Um, it makes it, it's extremely difficult for scholars to do, right? That's why we don't do it. I mean, we're very, you know, because, um, and that's what I, where I would encourage actually work that um, uh, where, you know, big data people come in and help cultural studies people uh, to, to kind of make sense of the architecture and the linkages of a specific topic. Um, and I'm actually, I just worked on a proposal, on a grant proposal on, on COVID um, um, coverage, like the false news on COVID coverage. And that's the idea here is actually that data scientists first structure across various countries, the kind of, um, you know, dialogue and then cultural people come in and look at it. What does it actually mean from an ideological perspective? It's extremely challenging. It's extremely different, different, uh, difficult to analyze. But at the same time, I think if we, if we, if we go back to representation, um, I would argue it didn't really improve our ideas of representation. It just kept people maybe happier because now they have their own fields, their own, uh, own outlets. So if you are not happy with how you're represented in mainstream, you can now go to your own channels and, and you see your own thing. But does it really you know, filter or, or go across? I'm not very optimistic. Oh, sorry, I don't hear you, Usha. I don't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, so we also do have within our department, you know, some of our doctoral students are looking at these sorts of um, niche publics, right? And niche uh, producers mm -hmm. who are not so niche when you look at India just because of the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one um, thing that you said, of course, makes sense that, you know, sometimes when you don't find yourself in the mainstream, then you go to a space where you do find yourself. Um, but then in this sort of a situation, you know, typical representation studies have a sense of the mainstream and the other. Mm -hmm. um, so who then becomes the other? So, mm -hmm. okay, I have two sorts of questions. One is, you know, within these niches, who is the other? Mm -hmm. Because then you also generate different stereotypes, perhaps of those who have not been historically stereotyped. Yeah. Um, that's one. But the other is... Um, you know, one of the arguments within media activist circles, for instance, has been that one way to tackle misrepresentation or stereotypical representation is to have more of the other in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, and we are seeing now much more of the other yeah. in the mainstream. Yet the publics that these others address um, are still imagined in, I guess, the old ways. Mm -hmm. So... The, even the others within the mainstream, uh, you know, perpet continue to perpetuate the same representation. So I'm not sure if that's clear, but the two kinds of things going on and yeah. So right. Absolutely. Uh, uh, a very, very important point, because I'm also someone who, you know, my, in my dissertation already have the word the other. Right. And of course, what we do is there are two ways as scholars, we freeze then the other ourselves. 
you know, we, because we have to find them, we have to look for them, of course, right? And also, if you have these kind of token uh, positions, right? Let's say we have more news reporters who are from you know, traditional minority groups, or we have more actors. Um, we, we, of course, they're casted in some sense in their other positions, so it doesn't allow them, it freezes them again in the same problematic space. So I couldn't agree uh, more. And also because of, um, I guess, because I looked into travel journalism for my dissertation, actually the Discovery Network, which has an audience all over the world. I wrote very, very early an article talking about, um, you know, what does it mean if you are a kind of a global media maker, global journalist, how can you actually represent the other? Because your audience is, you know, are all others. So, you know, it's really, um, and I think at that point when I wrote it, nobody kind of uh, got this <laughs> so well because it was, you know, it's of course an, uh, you know, a, a niche problem, but it still is an issue uh, at the same time. Uh, so what I have a whole chapter on the other, on questioning the idea of the other, because as long as we keep this concept, of course we are freezing, um, you know, a, a specific class and gender and uh, race position also. And that's uh, it really, uh, problematic. At the same time, you know, if it's okay, give up on the idea of the other, we, we have to be careful not to give up on the idea of power, because representation is power. Those who shape representation shape, of course, how we see the world. So if you say suddenly, oh, you know, everybody's the same, happy, happy, you know, it's all a happy world, um, then we are really forgetting that it's not uh, the same. If you are an African-American man in the United Hello? States and you're stopped by Angela. police, it's not the same world, right? It's not, um, uh, could even if... Just yeah, I think somebody has their microphone on. Could the others please keep your microphones off? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. You know, from, so but if you think about it, there is a, a lived experience of being othered. So it's, you know, and, and that's tied to how you're actually represented. And, uh, um, you know, it's really uh, to say just simply, that, and that's, but that's why oftentimes um, people who do work on post-racism are, you know, criticized to say, you know, you really, um, well, let's start with the, how we started now our discussion. In the end, you ultimately might ignore um, actual unjust uh, conditions. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question and then throw it open to the others, um, which has to do with media literacy as an intervention strategy, right? Which you again mentioned in your uh, chapter. And um, I think you make the comment that it's been, um, you know, innocuous deconstruction. I think that's the phrase that you use. Um, and I think media literacy efforts, whether at the school level or adult media literacy, has all been about taking apart the media to understand its workings. Um, and this has also been a criticism of cultural studies in general, that, you know, cultural studies is great at pointing out what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with media, but doesn't do very much to suggest how to set it right. Um, so I'm wondering what might a media literacy strategy look like that um, goes beyond innocuous de deconstruction? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, first of all, I have to say, I really... Um... I'm a big fan of media literacy. I really think media should be studied also in at least a high school level. Um, like in, the, in Britain, they do that actually now, um, uh, and not just in, in college, but even in college, hopefully everybody has once at one time a class that does, uh, you know, teaches deconstruction or the sense of what it what the media actually does. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan. So that's there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I teach it. I'm also in some sense in the you know, area of media literacy. Um, so one shouldn't underestimate their kind of ideas of uh, what it means to explain it actually when I have and we all have you know these moments in the classroom where people have just never thought about it before right and it really opens up their way and after having done this now for 20 years it's also for me really reassuring when now we have high school uh, like you know freshmen coming into college and they already talk the talk right they know it they know what's going on um on a side note, what happened here, what happened in the United States, you might have heard is that um, one aspect of critical studies, which is race theory, critical race theory has become um, the kind of scapegoat for the political right to say this is terrible because all they do is blame white people. Right. And that's kind of, and I think that's what I call a little bit the kind of maybe problematic media literacy, where it's all about see what we all did wrong, wrong, wrong. You know, there's nothing, you know, uh, not thinking about how we can actually do it differently. So I do like media literacy um, concepts where, we, where it's a lot about production, uh, where people are uh, using the means of production, which is, of course, also now so much more easier. Just give, you know, people have cell phones and they can film and they can do things. Uh, and not so much also to kind of represent themselves because that's also 
of course, always limited. It's also naive to think, oh, if you give you know others um, cameras, then everything will be um, happy. Um, but it's also about understanding uh, you know how what it is to film and to be kind of um, to, 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 to find angles to be professional about it how you start to narrow what is actually uh, seen so I you know I would I'm still a strong fan of media literacy overall but I think it has to um, include also production and access as, as important markers, you know, because access is also one of these big topics, who can actually participate, who has the bandwidth, you know, all of that, 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 that has to be part of the kind of political movement uh, of media literacy. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, these past, uh, this past year and a half has actually highlighted that in multiple ways, right, even outside what we might strictly consider the media domain, in terms of who can speak, who has the bandwidth and the space and the voice even to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Great. Um, thank you. Um, so maybe we can throw it open to questions from the audience. Um, and Amrita, I will allow you to moderate that. Right. So um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Fusish, for the, um, you know, such an exciting presentation and Professor Sharaman for her thought-provoking question. Uh, I think several interesting stuff waiting for us uh, to talk about. So uh, I think we'll move on to the live question answer session. So um, participants, those who want to ask questions can just raise their hands and I can call you and you can um, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your questions. Um, others who want to maybe uh, post questions in the chat box can do that here or in the FB um, comment box. Um, so I can't see any raised hands right now, but okay, we know sir has raised his hand. So, um, sir, if you could just go ahead, it would be good. Yeah. Thanks, Amrita. Uh, thank you, Alfreda, for that uh, talk and for drawing our attention back to one of the fundamental questions in media and communication studies, which is about uh, politics of representation. Uh, in my uh, uh, question, and not really a question, I'm just one thinking aloud uh, about the methodological implications of uh, uh, the, the attention given to representation and representational politics. So over a period of time, our discipline has been quite uh, immersed if not uh, obsessed with the text and, and the content, right? And, and it reminds me of, uh, you know, Marshall McLuhan's uh, famous comment about, you know, if you're uh, looking intently at uh, what's in the picture, you know, and not looking at the frame, uh, I mean, we, we, we miss the larger story about the structures that enable certain kinds of uh, content, right? So whether this uh, sort of uh, overwhelming attention to representation drives us into sort of methodological silos, you know, a whole bunch of us doing textual analysis, content analysis, and there are others doing, you know, the larger political economy work, you know, completely oblivious to the content. Uh, and then there are, of course, uh, John Fisk and, and, and others of his kind uh, doing audience work. I and mean, saying that, you know, if you're only obsessed with the text, you're missing the fact that audiences actively engage with the text, negotiate, I mean, Stuart Hall again, right? I mean, and they are doing ethnographies and, you know, audience studies and so on. So at a time when, you know, increasingly people are advocating a more sort of integrated approach to media, text, audiences, production, and so on. How does the attention back on representational politics uh, overcome this kind of methodological uh, silos? I mean, uh, yeah. so that, that's something yeah. I'm just wondering aloud. Yeah. 
No, very, very extremely important point. And it goes back to uh, even early um, debates in cultural studies where it was always what's more important, like the, the you know, mater material aspects of the world, or is it actually the text? And um, the culturalist turn, of course, is always uh, criticized for being not uh, forgetting about the context. And I think the point I made in the end is, of course, also such a point to say that you know, if there are given injustices, that uh, you know, we really have to. Um, it doesn't help us to change the media. You know, if it, the world doesn't change. So I think we. I, I would agree with you fully. Uh, while I am a textual scholar and I see many, many advantages in textual work, uh, it's no. It's not my idea of textual work. Is really to show um, kind of what's going on right now, as opposed to how should it be. Uh, it's not the solution. You know, the, it, there's no solution in the text in some sense automatically. Uh, so I couldn't agree more. And uh, just to kind of highlight a little bit what I read in political science, um, like political philosophy, um, the idea of one of my colleagues here at Pitt writes about that democracy is actually a sense of uh, um, a commitment that we actually commit to something as opposed to, you know, we have a system of rules or regulations, now we have a commitment for a just world. I think that might help us out of uh, the representation work also to say that, you know, ultimately we, um, we are not looking for a par a paradise uh, representations, which we will never have, but we, we have to stay committed to a um, no, democratic, um, inclusive public sphere, and that should shape our representations. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have a raised hand from Oswell Moyo. Uh, so if you could just go ahead and ask your question. Oswell Moyo. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Sir. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. It was eye opening and thought provoking. My, my question that I have for you is, well, in representation, I want to understand then how, how do you navigate issues of uh, decoloniality, especially from Global South, how the world has been representing Global South? What was mm -hmm. the epistemic and the cultural turn? I'm from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, wonderful. So I want to understand, how, I want to understand the issues of, uh, because if, if I, there's the Nessus, there's the Conflict: How the world represents Africa, and mm -hmm. how yeah, I, we lost you here a little bit, but uh, I do understand the questions. And uh, one of my central concerns was always uh, my research concern was about representation others outside borders. Um, and especially, of course, others, as we, as we all know, the world is, um, has a very st a strict power structure. And obviously, the global south is misrepresented, right? Very much misrepresented. And we know this also, especially in the news, um, there are a lot of problems when it comes to representing the south that we only focus on catastrophes and major crises. Uh, and so that the research, we've done this research, and also sadly, sadly, I have to say, um, it's not changing a whole lot. And why is it not changing a whole lot? because I mean, news international journalism is shrinking as we speak. And, uh, but I think I see progress in uh, entertainment media. So I think that right now, I think there are moments in films and in other aspects that are really, really central and important. And the internet also plays a very big role. Um, so for example, this year during the Olympics in the United States, there was an ad campaign um, that uh, 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 emphasize or showed really African skateboarders. And it was based on some trendsetter, someone who, you know, some influencer from um, Africa. And so I thought it was really important or interesting to see that there is some moments, at least we have moments of change, right? And that's, uh, but I agree with you, this is an important topic. And just because I'm saying we have to kind of maybe change how we uh, research representation or how we think representation doesn't mean that there are not enough stereotypes still around that have to be called out. And that's really important to keep calling them out. Thank you for this question. Right, so we have another raised hand from um, Gargi Shivanan. So she has also um, posted a question in the chat box as well. So if you we could just go ahead and ask your question, Gargi. Um, hello. 
good evening everybody my question to the professors is um, does preference for cultural culturally proximate media shows uh, reinforce stereotypes are cultural proximity and stereotypes uh, contradictory in the sense that we cannot dictate to the audience what they should prefer and again the questions of uh, false consciousness and things like that come up so what is the how do we reconcile uh, the cultural proximity aspect of preference and the social responsibility of uh, media creators mm -hmm. I think that's an important point, if I understand you right. There is, of course, also um, almost like a cognitive or biological fact of othering, right? And that's kind of, like you said, cultural proximity is, of course, based on the idea that we cannot understand everything all the time so we or, or um, even accept um, perceive everything all the time so we have to make choices to kind of not be to not be overwhelmed so that's a human fact so i agree fully i would also say that this is uh, also something to, important to keep in mind for uh, cultural scholars again to say you know this is actually a, a very human what's going on here uh, that doesn't mean we cannot uh, call out the problems of the, uh, the effect of it so oftentimes with my students for example i analyze journalism and I, I will always only analyze good journalism right I'm not looking at the ones where it's very clearly stereotyped no but I analyze journalism that really tries very hard to do something different but then still these factors come in and you see that you know what is actually the consequence of this kind of um, professional rules so I agree with you um, however if you come back to this idea of commitment um, if you accept that this is something that humans do, you know, we lazy, our lazy brains do, then we really have to, um, you know, subscribe to this idea that it's an effort, it will be effortful, and we should engage in this effort, because without this effort, we will not have a, a just system. Um, if I can just kind of jump in there to, um, you know, to add to um, what you. you said, Elfrida, is... You know, there are, um, there was a very interesting um, study that was done by um, this young scholar at MICA, where she looked at, I mean, exactly this kind of context, right, where you have culturally proximate, but um, um, separate groups. Um, and uh, despite the proximity, their dependence on like a distant media to give them information yeah. about their perceived other. And um, she found, and this is some work by Kiran Bhatia, and you could probably look her work up. Um, she found that um, the moment you forced uh, interaction, she was working with school children. Mm -hmm. um, then um, uh, they're forced to also recognize that their understanding of the other is based on stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps the answer to that is not through what we might consider traditional media, but it comes, um, you know, in other forms of intervention. So through school textbooks, through education programs, and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so next we have um, Anjali ma'am has raised her hand. So ma'am, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor, for that very enlightening uh, presentation. Um, I did miss uh, some part of it because my connectivity was a little patchy. Uh, but my question is a very basic kind of question. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking of what's happening in Afghanistan and the kind of, um, you know, um, I, I just wonder if, if stereotypical representation happens from all sides of the spectrum, political spectrum, you know, I mean, of course, there is stereotyping from uh, the forces that own, uh, you know, power structures, but also those that want to dismantle uh, stereotypes can be engaging in their own set of stereotypes. You know, so for example, I, I mean, I was going through Twitter and some people, some people from the academia were writing that, uh, you know, Taliban, in some academic circles, Taliban is justified as a decolonizing moment. And, and and actually uh, sort of sidelining the kind of struggles that uh, women in, in that country would face under a Taliban uh, regime. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, in cultural studies and in, in, in academia in general, what kind of blind spots can people just, uh, you know, sort of become aware of themselves? 
yeah that's my question i think this is an extremely important point and um looking into that's why i have this whole chapter on the other as i said before where i really I try to see actually more philosophical what is the other and and how do we actually create it and uh the sense is you're also absolutely right that there's kind of this co uh, just because you are less powerful does not mean that you really create uh problematic ways of um stereotyping so uh, you're absolutely right so it's uh, and that maybe goes back to this idea that um gargi brought up this that, that this human kind of sense of uh, of selection that we all do all the time um so that's an important factor that we should take into account uh because i i and that comes then back to the second point you made about the progressive politics suddenly seeing um oppressors um, you know and i will call the taliban oppressors i uh, you know as as a as a force for good um and that really just shows that oh because they are less presumably less powerful in the in the world right then they must be good right if they are and that's uh, i would argue it's ridiculous in order to to think in these terms and it's really um but it shows that um it's it it, it comes to this kind of almost celebration of the other as long as it comes from the other it must be good right and a lot of diversity politics actually also do this i think and uh, again what this actually does is i would argue again it robs the other in that sense uh, a part of their humanity uh, their full spectrum of humanity because it just makes them these uh, makes the others these good people they're just you know always good and that's you know i think that's a very typical um problem of western progressive circles maybe because i've lived in even in india also i married my husband is bengali um i think i've seen um you know I go every year I travel every year also to India so I think if you have my global exposure you realize that there are kind of you know that it is well, the life spectrum is much more complex than a western I would say progressive um circles make it out to be thank you thank you for that answer so uh, i think we are almost done um, can't find any more raised hands here um does anybody else have a question if if you do just raise your hand um otherwise uh, elfride ma'am i had a question to ask is it okay if i could yes. go ahead <laughs> of course uh, so uh, my question is just from the presentation that uh, you showed and Uh, you showed where there was this particular quote from a scholar saying that the cultural studies discipline has sort of lost its edge uh, and uh, i i'm i'm thinking there is some context to that is it uh, or i wanted to know what exactly um, mm -hmm. led to that sort of attention within the discipline and um, what is the reason why how uh, of that so if you could just elaborate on that sure so i think it's a uh, this is um, reflecting of course the kind of american uh, cultural studies but you know i have i was in graduate school in the 90s and at that point this field became really uh, important in the united states and then i'm originally of course german but i uh, know i learned it i heard about it and then i came to the us and did a lot in it and it was really really exciting because every every new study was kind of different and new and something we hadn't thought about and for me honestly if i um and you know, while i am i come out of journalism uh, i really enjoyed looking into popular culture and even understanding journalism as a form of culture that was really for me extremely important i wouldn't be in this area if i hadn't been allowed in some sense to do this um but i have to say myself i mean I, I, what i read right now what is interesting for me after you know being so excited throughout the 90s into the early 2000s um now i read much more other journals other you know whatever comes out in the mainstream cultural studies journals seems to be always the same it's over and over again the same right so there's somewhat of a we have settled a bit right it's not as exciting anymore and just that what um dr ramen also brought up the sense of that we what about digital like what's going on there i think there's a lot of exciting things are happening and of course some of the scholars use cultural means also to explain it uh, but you know there's also playing with big data and you know web architecture and all kinds of new things and um so i think in that sense that's how um this editor felt like it's just not as um we don't have a strong voice anymore in the community and i think it's like 
just on a side note, the reason is ultimately actually that a core group of, of scholars in the United States also isolated themselves quite a bit. They were, it was a bit incestuous. They were doing their own work all the time on, and publishing each other. And I think that uh, in some sense, it just needs a new generation of people to kind of refresh this program. So thank you, Elfriede, ma'am, for that. Uh, so um, are there any more questions? If there are, it, OK, I can't find any questions. Professor Raman, do you have anything to add? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, we could go on and on, you know, talking about this. And if you let Elfrida and me do that, we might be up till two o'clock. But so I will not do that. Um, but yeah, but just thank you so much for doing this. And I let um, you say the formal thank yous, Amrita. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Elfrida, ma'am, for this um, interesting conversation. And um, thank you so much for the presentation, it was really good. And thank you all the participants for being so open with their questions. And um, thank you everyone for participating. And thank you, Professor Rahman, obviously. <laughs> so yeah, I think, thank you all for joining us. Thanks, and just my last word, thank you so much. It was just wonderful to be back in Hyderabad, at least uh, via Zoom. And uh, I got a lot of new ideas, so just so much fun to talk about it. We were so isolated in the uh, in during pandemic, so it's wonderful to talk about my work with you. Thank you. Thanks for the great ideas you've given me.